Well, the lesson's going to focus on the next generation science standards, um, particularly the kindergarten earth and human activity um, standard in which animals, how, how animals adapt to their environment. Um, so students are going to start out by looking at the different habitats that we've talked about um, and the animals that live in it and the dangers that they may face and how they have adapted to survive to their environment. Who can tell me what this habitat is? <clears throat> Jace, what habitat is that? <laughs> what is it? It's somewhere hot. It's not the beach. Let Jace answer. Jace, do you know which one that is? Who can help Jace out? Carson? The desert. The desert. Who can tell me why Carson thinks that this is the desert? Raise your hand. Anna, why is this the desert? Because it's hot. It's hot? How do we know it's hot? Because. Carson, how do we know it's hot? Be because it has, because, um, there's no grass like the grassland. Yeah, there's no grass. What is there? Just sand. Sand. And Adrian, could you add to Carson's idea? And the right, no, um, there's sun and it's making no grass come and it's so hot, no grass grows. Yeah, the sun's so hot that there's not any grass growing. Good. Um, we are taking a look at a specific animal that I have chosen out of each habitat that we've studied. Um, Next Generation Science focuses on phenomena, and so the animals I've chosen have something unique about them that most animals don't have. For example, in the polar region is the polar bear, and it has the blubber that protects it. Um, so students are going to be able to see the polar bear has the blubber to protect it from the cold weather, and then we're going to be looking at a science experiment where they can actually um, feel the water the way that a polar bear does. Jace, what animal is that? Polar bear. Polar bear. Where do you think the polar bear lives? Carson? Um, at... What habitat does it live in? At the polar. In the polar habitat. Do you know what's special about this polar bear? What's this polar bear doing? Swimming. Swimming. Think about the water at the polar yeah. region. How do you think it feels? Anessa, how do you think it feels? Cold. Cold. How does a polar bear survive swimming in cold water and snow? Does anybody have an idea? No. Jacob, what do you think? It has lots of fur. Let's write down polar bear. So it has fur. Why do uh, polar bears need to swim to move around, Jacob? They could go after their food. They could go after their food. What's an animal called that goes after its food? There's a name for animals that eat other animals, though. What is that called? Predators. Predator. So predators are animals that hunt other animals for food. What does a polar bear eat? Fish. What else? Carson? Chicken. Do chickens live in the polar areas? No. <laughs> That's pretty cold. Watch this video, and I want you to tell me what you see in this video when we're done, okay? All right, tell me what you saw in that video. Jace, what'd you see? You saw a polar bear. What was he doing? Swimming. Swimming. Anna, what did you see? Did you see some fish in there? I thought I saw some fish swimming around, so what do you think the polar bear was doing? He's probably trying to catch fish. What else did you see in that water? You saw icebergs, so how does that water feel? Cold. Cold. Have you ever taken a cold bath? Raise your hand. No, I took a cold, freezing bath. What did you I like it? I hated yeah. it. It felt terrible, didn't it? I expect all of them to be engaged in conversation. I expect them to bring up pre-knowledge of the habitats that we've talked about and perhaps pre-knowledge of animals that we talk about that they might have read about or discussed with their families. I have a couple of students who are very scientific people and uh, they're bringing in facts that they learn at home on a daily basis to tell me about. So they'll probably know more than I expect them to know at this point. I have some water here. 
with ice in it. And it's supposed to be cold like the polar bear swims in. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our, our uh, turns sticking our hands in that water. Anya, can you do it first? Can you grab those paper towels for me? When you're done with them. Is that really cold? I'm going to introduce you to something that a polar bear has that is special about it, okay? It's something called blubber. Does anybody know what blubber is? Blubber. Look at that polar bear. Who can use adjectives to describe this bear? Um, the polar bear, he has, um, fur. Oh, I think it, he is he has skin and that skin is really tough. The skin is tough? And it keeps him warm underwater. Okay, so it has tougher skin than us, maybe? Why is it fat? Because it eats a lot of food. Eats a lot of food. And the hard skin. The hard skin makes it fat because it's really hard. You think the skin makes it fat? Let me show you what blubber looks like. This is what blubber looks like. It's nothing more than fat. So do you think a polar bear has a lot of fat to keep it warm? Put it in the water. Why would we put it in the water? All right, so a polar bear has a lot of blubber on its body, which is another word for fat. Look here. So pretend this is the polar bear's bone, okay? And if you put your bone with a lot of fat around it, that fat makes it warmer. And then it doesn't feel the cold as much. So if I take my glove and I stick it in here like this, do you think I still feel the cold water? No. Let's try it. Anya, stick your hand in there. Does it feel different? Yeah, but it's a little cold. But not as cold, is it? No. Carson? It felt warm and cold. So, if we used our blubber, did it make the water warmer or colder? Well, the water stayed the same, but it made our body what? Warmer. Before, when I taught science, I did science experiments where there was this set rules put into place that the teacher said, first you do this, then you do this, then you do this, and the students did it but it didn't really bring about the learning that they have now. Now we do what they term investigations. Um, so the students are actually encouraged to be creative on their own. So all I do is I hand them materials and say, you're going to do this, but I don't tell them how to do it. They have to figure it out on their own how to do it. I want you to create your own rattlesnake using the materials that I've just given you. Talk with your friends and figure out how you're gonna make it. Vanessa, what are you doing? Okay. And then this could be the rattle. This is going to be the rattle? Yeah. This is going to be the rattle. Make sure we try and keep our popcorn kernels on the table. And this is the rattler. All right. Now tell me, why are you filling this all the way to the top? Here, put it on. Does it make a good noise? Yeah. You didn't put, how come you didn't put as many kernels in yours? Because look, it makes a better rattle. Oh, could you tell your friends that? Yeah. Can you guys look at Jacob? Tell him what you did. I didn't fill it up as much and it made a better rattle. Is that a good idea? Yeah. Let me hear it now. Does it sound better? Oh, it's louder, isn't it? Show your friends what you did, though, to make the body. I want it, like, on the bottom. Do you guys see how you taped it? Yeah, so I want the But how are, you gonna, how are you going to put these together to make it into a body? Um, twist them up.
Um, well, the blubber experiment, the first one I did, I actually consider a science experiment where I told them what to do and they followed the step-by-step -step procedures, which they were still able to learn from. It's not a bad thing to do a science experiment with step-by-step -step procedures. Um, you, you know, for example, chemistry, you're going to have to follow something like that. It's still good to use those, but I like the investigations more for like when they created the rattlesnakes where I just set the materials out and said, okay, now I want you to create a snake. They were able to do that on their own. It's surprising the way that they amaze me on a daily level. They learn vocabulary words that are above the level that they need to know, um, and it helps them. I think that they learn these words and this vocabulary because they're actually using the words through scientific investigation rather than just memorizing them out of a book. I have found an app on my tablet called Switch Zoo, and so what they are supposed to do is they get, they pick a certain animal and then they have um, other animals they can pick from to switch the head or switch the tail or switch the legs to create a whole new animal. So at the end, what we're going to do is we're going to create an animal of the future and they're going to get to pick the different body parts to put on but then they will also have to tell me which habitat it would best belong in and how the different body parts would adapt to that habitat. The cheetah? Yeah. Why'd you pick the rhino? The rhino head is because I want him to keep his health to poop and to keep his... Um, so Pick he's got the tusks to protect, or the horns to protect him? Uh-huh, and to eat. And to eat? Green. Yes. What do lizards do? What? Change color. What's that called? <laughs> cat leg. A cat leg. Jacob, what's that called? Look at my, look at my. Hold on, I'll be there in just a minute. Um. <laughs> what's it called when they, there you go, they camouflage. Very good. Where would lizards live? Forest. In the forest? Good. The fact that they remembered the habitats, the fact that they knew the basic needs for animals, um, they knew predator and prey, they understood hibernation and camouflage. These are things that you don't usually see on a kindergarten level since science hasn't been in the classroom. And now that we've reintroduced it and we're actually looking at all these things, and they're able to talk about it and understand what they're talking about believe makes me believe that it's a higher level of thinking.